Hey, Composing Gloves here, and today we're going to be talking about combination tones. Now, real quick, cast your mind back to the previous lesson, the previous video in the series, the Critical Listening series. You remember beats. Beats were a physical phenomena. I need to draw the difference. So beats were a physical phenomena that actually happened in the real world. There were actual waveforms, and when they summed together, you know, within 20 hertz or so, you would hear volume fluctuations and we talked about the variations that this can happen on and when they're more severe and less severe combination tones are very different in that they they wow they exist exclusively in your head they are a psychoacoustic phenomena and they make certain instruments sound the way they do so pianos sound largely the way they do because of combination tones so i'm going to play for you two tones and before we get into this you need to know that the, the volume envelope plays a role in this. And I'm going to let you sort of think about that. I might bring it up again. But if you watch the Beats video, I, I, I say that the volume and the volume of the different areas of the spectrum will change the way that this happens. All that applies to this. So let's get into this. So what I have here is I have two, two tones. I have one at 600 hertz. It's a, a sine wave. And another sine wave at 1K, 1,000 hertz. Now, this is what they sound like. Isolate this. Hopefully you're in a good listening environment. You have some good headphones or good monitors so you can hear this. Your space will affect this as well, um, but it shouldn't affect it too much. So let's just play one. So that is one kilohertz. I want you to pay attention to that one tone. Notice what that one tone sounds like. Now let's go over to operator two. We have this 600 hertz um, going on here. Now if I play the 600 hertz, uh, with, in order to do that, I got to turn it on. Here it is. So you paid attention to that. Picture what those should sound like together. Now, when I play them, you tell me if all you hear are those two frequencies. So we're going to play them together. Here we go. Do you hear that? There are four frequencies there there are and if you're familiar with this effect then you know but if you're not familiar you might be going what the junk because if you listen to them apart that's one here's six here are they together you might be going where are those extra frequencies you hear that sort of annoying zzz, that like buzzing sort of sound thing what is that well what happens is is when they're over 50 hertz or, or more because if they are too close then they're perceived as a volume difference we want tones and so tones around 50 hertz is pretty apparent and again if you're if these things take time to turn on then that's going to alter your perception of this and then also i'm going to say it one more time if you have a spectrum of this stuff going on it's also going to alter your, your perception of this because they happen at very different levels like the upper levels of a sound wave for example are so soft that it's very hard to hear any real combination tones they, they're they're going on but in your brain at least but they're so small that they're basically not going on if that makes any sense so we have here two uh, sine waves and what happens is we have 1600 and we get two additional series so we're still playing our 1600 uh, hertz but now we're getting the sum of those two tones and so we're getting 1600 hertz and so we're hearing that as a tone your, your brain does that for you because if we look at our spectrogram those those frequencies are nowhere to be seen they're not there and now if we now we're hearing that one, and then we're hearing also a difference tone. So we're hearing 1,000 minus 600. And when you get that, you get 400 hertz. So the lower tone that you're hearing is the 400 hertz tone. The upper tone you're hearing is the, uh, the 1,600 tone. And then you're hearing the 1,000 and the 600 as separate parts. Now you might be saying, okay, that's really cool. How does this matter? Well, let's look at a more, little more complicated of an example. Let's look at a saw wave. So here we've got two saw waves. And if we play them, you so here is the one kilohertz saw wave. Here is a 600 hertz saw wave. And together, we get them again. Except for now, you're getting them for all the components that this lines up for. So every single... So each one of these, if you were to convert this to sound harmonics, each one of these lines represents an individual sine wave component. Each one of these is rubbing shoulders with, with each one of these at the various levels, and they're all adding together and giving you a series of some indifference tones. So you actually get a whole series back. <laughs> now, 
this is the reason why certain instruments sound the way they do. It's the way it's the reason why certain chords sound the way they do. So of course that your reproduction, if you're reproducing accurately and you're in a nice space, but some spaces may augment this because if you have speakers, you know, and they're like a hundred, well, not a hundred feet. Let's just say they're like 30 feet that way. And they're blasting music, like really freaking loud. I don't know. You could be hundreds of feet away, I guess if you're at like a live venue or whatever. But let's just say you're like in an indoor dance or whatever, and you have speakers 30 feet away that direction, and they're blasting at you. By the time you're going to be hit with reflections and off walls, off the floor, and the direct sound, and then you could be moving. So that can all alter your perception of that timbre. Because now the receive now you're getting those two frequencies at different moments and times. And if you're moving around, you might have issues with phase. And so it's going to sound different. So anyways, that's why certain things can sound so different in different circumstances. But, and then again, these things are, these combination tones are substantially, these ones that are at the ringing and the really, really high frequency stuff, these ones, are going to be substantially softer because when they sum together and subtract together, first off, they're way higher and we're less sensitive to that. And they also are just much softer because there's they're not summing as much as these guys are now keep in mind this is all psychoacoustic right now there, there's not an actual third series being generated here or I, I technically four two two dish two additional series because there's the difference in the sum tones so this this should sound suspiciously like ring modulation and uh electronically it, it is ring modulation sort of so now what we're going to do is we are going to look at a piano and check this out so i'm going to play a note and this, this is now quite a bit more advanced. This is a lot, a lot harder because a, a spectral analyzer, I can't pull one out. I can't show you it. You have to hear it. So if you were to play notes, you're going to get a similar deal going on here. But remember, we have an amplitude envelope. So they're going to be more present near the front in this case because that's where they're louder. And as they die off, they'll go away. So we have this sort of timbral change going on and keep in mind your ears natural eq curve that it puts in there the fletcher munson curves things like that so that's going on and then we need to keep in mind the difference between the two notes and that they're really the series is kind of uh, it's not a perfect saw series it's a very strange sort of series in some ways so what we're going to play now is i'm going to play one tone and i'm going to play another tone and when we play them together i played a fifth when we play them together, we're going to get... So I'll play one more time. Now we're going to hear the sum and difference tones when we play them together. So you can hear it. So... You could spend a long time just going through instruments and doing that. Like, it's it's much easier in the synthesis land because you have that. But if we were to if we were to set this to default, do do and change this to like, well, we could, we could just mess around with these. Now we have additional things going on here that are the result of some of it is sort of related to beats. Other parts I don't completely understand. Um, but if we were to oversample this, now that you can hear it. So we can attribute that one. You're hearing that one. That one's beats. You can hear that really easily, but the other, so that's where the movement's coming from and it's showing you j just everything. I think it is all beats. Now that I think about it because we we're oversampling it pretty heavy. So it's not going to be anything like that. Open a signal analyzer. But then we're also getting those combination tones, which cause it to sound a little more rich than it actually is. Because so it's kind of a cool deal what we have going on here. So, anyways, that's why some of the instruments sound the way that they do. That's that's what makes them tick. So that's kind of cool. And you can apply this, of course, to your mixes. You can say, oh, he's playing chords, he's playing these kind of chords. It's why power chords sound the way power chords sound like, is they they invite particular series of harmonics to be um, encouraged. 
If you have any questions about this, let me know. Uh, hopefully this helps you in your mixes and your listening. Just another thing that you can go, oh, that's what that was. And you see we just identified the beats and we're like, oh, that's definitely not combination tones. But now you can hear them hopefully as separate things. We're like, oh, that was beats. But this element of the sound is combination tone. So if you were going to go after the combination tone with an EQ, you would have to go after that, that particular element of a sound with a with an EQ that's farther apart. If you wanted to eliminate beats, you would go after EQ where the frequencies are closer together, if that makes sense. So again, just rewatch the video if you're still a little bit confused. But again, if the EQ, if it's beats, the frequencies are gonna be closer together. So you're gonna EQ frequencies closer together to try and eliminate that beating problem. If especially if they're, ideally if it's like near the same frequency in two different elements, we just do that. But if you're trying to fix the way a particular sound is, you'd go into that one sound um, and if you're dealing with combination tones, you would change the level of the highs versus the lows. And that's why also when you begin to roll things off in an EQ, um, you'll, things will become to start to sound thin. Like what happens is a little way more complicated than you're just removing these frequencies. You're also removing psychoacoustic cues that we use to, we associate with richness and fullness. So if, and then if the low end, these frequencies are so much closer together, you're dealing with beats and combination tones. Um, at the same time, mostly this is more of a beat still to an extent down here, whereas up here, this is very combination tone oriented because it's really, really easy to get 50 hertz or more apart in the upper side. So again, if you have any questions, let me know. Subscribe, support me on Patreon, and have a blessed day.